Hello and welcome everyone to the Hutchin Center's Alum Fellows Reading Series. We are thrilled to have Julie Kleinman, a former fellow with us. She'll be speaking about her wonderful book, Adventure Capital, Migration and the Making of an African Hub in Paris. And Professor Jean Komarov will be introducing her and engaging her in conversation. And those two parts will then be followed by a Q&A with the audience. Professor Jean Komarov is Professor of African Studies and Anthropology here at Harvard. Please welcome Professor Komarov. Thank you very much and delighted to be here. Um, let me introduce Julie Kleinman or reintroduce because she's no stranger to many of the institutions of this kind of art. So Julie comes to us from Fordham University uh, where she's an associate professor. Before that, she was an assistant professor at Penn State. And before that, she was a Mellon postdoc fellow at Oberlin College. Uh, Judy took her PhD uh, from Harvard University right here in social anthropology and Middle Eastern studies. But she was an undergraduate at Haverford and she also has an MA from the EHSS. Now I first met Judy, I think it was the first time we met in Paris 2010, when you were doing your field work at the Gardenau, and I was giving a talk at the University of Chicago Center in Paris. And I uh, must say, uh, I give, admit that I'd given that talk a few times before, but you asked me a question that was totally novel and in fact became very central to my revision of that center, that section of my work. So I was impressed and we, we got to know each other after that. And I soon came to realize just how original and imaginative. Julie's work is. And as we will hear, those of you who haven't actually heard her um, read before, she's an extraordinarily gifted field worker as well. Her research is situated at the intersection between urban and migration studies. And she looks at the circulation of people between West Africa and France in the aftermath of formal colonialism and how that circulation remakes material and affective infrastructures, categories of belonging. Uh, formations of nationalism and racialization. Working on what she calls the adventure capital, the hub of ethnic France, um, she also did field work and, and I think archival research too in Mali and Senegal. And she provides an account which disrupts prevailing narratives about desperate migrants landing up on Europe's shores in interesting ways. And I hope we can talk about that uh, in the Q&A. Reviewers also noted of this book that it's, it, it really provides a very rich, a Bildungsroman, a kind of coming of age tale that centers on a clutch of, of, of young migrants um, at the uh, adventure uh, uh, capital and, and their stories to kind of build reputations and as they put it, become somebody. Uh, and, and they do so in a way that in many ways undercuts the expectations, I think, of what occur at the at, at, in French kind of uh, popular and state imagining. Her subsequent research also has focused on an, the emerging politics, and this has been hardly visible, I think, in the migration literature, uh, of, of those who are marginalized by fortress Europe, those who land up in places like Mali as deportees, they criminalized as such, and they struggle for thinking about how we might organize around migrant rights and what they call the freedom to circulate. Uh, and they build transnational networks and infrastructures across borders. And I hope we might have a chance to talk about that if there's time, because it's a fascinating kind of complement to the story you tell. So apart from Adventure Capital, Migration and the Making of an African Hub in Paris, which was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2019, Judy has a range of other publications, just a couple to give you a sense um, of the interest that lies there. In 2020, Infrastructure Across Borders, Translating Adventures in Bamako and Paris, uh, in City and Society. In 2016, From Little Brother to Big Somebody, Coming of Age in the, at the Garden Nord, in Affective Circuits, African Journeys and the Pursuit of Social Regeneration, edited by Jennifer Cole and Christian Gross, and that's published also by the University of Chicago Press. Uh, and in 2014, Adventures in Infrastructure, Making an African Hub in Paris in City and Society. So we're delighted to have you here, Judy, and please 
entertain us with your reading. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Krishna, for inviting me. Um, I wrote much of this book while I was a fellow at the Hutchin Center. Um, so it's such a pleasure to be back and it was such a wonderful place for me to write this work and think more deeply about questions of race and the African diaspora as they related to my own work. Um, and thank you, of course, Jean, for that wonderful introduction. And also just sorry that there's, I live near a hospital, so this is a, I don't know how much you can hear. Um, so thank you so much for um, the introduction. And I remember that talk now more than a decade ago very well. I, I remember it very clearly. It was, uh, you know, very inspiring to me. So thank you. Um, and thank you for, for being an interlocutor on this project for, for all of that time. Um, okay, so I'm just going to dive right into the reading. I'm going to situate um, the book a little bit and I'm going to focus, I mean, by reading a bit from the introduction and then I will focus really on what I think makes the story alive, which is the, the adventurer's um, stories and, and particularly that of Lasana, who is one of the main or key informants in my book. Um, and my book is really about the intersection of the Gare du Nord and these adventures. In this case today, I'll be reading mostly more about the adventures and their stories, um, but I'm happy to talk about whatever in the discussion. <clears throat> okay. On a breezy spring day in 2010, Lassen and Yare and I sat sipping espressos at a cafe across the street from the Gare du Nord railway station in Paris. We gazed at the station's glass-walled entrance, where groups of young West African men stood chatting as people brushed by them on their way into the busiest rail hub in Europe. Originally from a village in rural Western Mali, Lassana had been living and working in France for almost a decade. He and his West African comrades met most evenings at the Gare du Nord, which they passed through on their evening commute. I had first met Lassana the previous fall in the station's front square. At the time, he sported neat cornrows in his hair and wore baggy jeans and a jersey emblazoned with the Bronx, along with a backwards Yankees cap. He had come to France in 2001 on a three-month visa and spent the better part of his 20s barely getting by as an undocumented cleaner and construction worker. He and many other West African workers came to the station for various reasons to catch up with friends, discuss the news, to find better jobs, to get a loan and meet new people. For them, the station had become more than a simple transit site. We are adventurers here, Lassana used to say, that is not foreigners, guest workers, refugees or migrants. Many West Africans I met in France used the term l'aventurier or adventurer and l'aventure adventure to describe themselves and their situation. And this was not just an attempt to romanticize difficult journeys and hard times. These terms and their equivalents have long been used among West Africans to signify that migration is an, an initiatory journey, a rite of passage. Seeing their voyages as part of a broader tradition helped to maintain connections to their families across long distances. It gave migrants a way to find meaning in risky travels and misfortune abroad. So Ninke are the greatest adventurers, Lassana once bragged, referring to his ethno-linguistic group that comprises about 2 million people in the Western Sahel, which I'm sure most of you know is a semi-arid region just south of the Sahara Desert, sort of covering Mali, Senegal, Mauritania, Guinea, Gambia, and Burkina Faso but which also has a significant global diaspora, the Suninke that is. His father and uncles all had left on adventures in their youth. Most of his brothers and cousins were on their own adventures in Central Africa and Spain. The notion of migration as an adventure was widespread among migrants at the Gare du Nord as it is with migrants from this region living across the globe. Lassana's vision departed from the assumptions of so-called economic migration applied to migrants like him, which assumes that migration is a relatively new phenomenon where poor people are forced to leave underdeveloped villages in Africa and go to work in European capitals. Lassana rather saw migration as a necessary stage of life and the continuation of a long tradition. He was not alone. Many West African migrants come from places where 
quote, not migrating is not living, as anthropologist Isaiah Dunyon puts it. The idiom of adventure is a way for Lasna and other West Africans to conceptualize their journeys. It also provides a new perspective for understanding migrant lives and struggles more broadly. The notion of migration as adventure challenges the nation state definition of immigration, which presumes that the migrant moves from one bounded entity into another with the goal of settling and attaining citizenship, and often in the xenophobic imaginary of relying on state subsidies. Instead, adventures live by the ethic of mobility, producing social and economic value by creating new networks for exchange and making the most of what anthropologist Anna Singh calls encounters across difference. Lasana and his friends see the Galdunar as the ultimate place to carry out their adventures. Instead of remaining within the well-trodden paths of kinship and village ties, they use the station to meet people outside of their communities, people who might help enable their onward mobility and realize future looking projects. Adventurers have transformed the largest railway hub in Europe, and the Gal du Nord has changed their life course. Like Lassana, many West Africans in France come from places where migration abroad is a rite of passage, and thus to remain at home is to feel stuck forever. When they are denied visas at the consulate and their in their home countries, as most poor migrants from the global south today are, they will set out for the desert and march toward the sea, paying smugglers and joining many refugees fleeing conflict. As many scholars and activists have shown, the EU could prevent these deaths and in border zones by providing legal paths for those who migrate. Instead, EU policy make migrant death more likely as European border control creeps further into the African continent. Those who do make it across face detention, deportation, and perilous onward journeys. Even those who get papers feel trapped, unable to return to their villages for fear that their temporary resident permits would not allow them to re-enter Europe. Lassana and his adventuring peers often use the word crossroads to describe what they appreciated at the Gare du Nord. Unlike segregated spaces of the Paris capital region so often studied in the scholarship on migration, it brings together people from all backgrounds. We all started out in the immigrant dormitory, Lassana used to say, referring to the foyers built in the 1950s in France to house foreign workers. But we didn't stay there for very long, he continued. We didn't want to put ourselves on the sidelines. His friend Mahmoud, an older Pakistani man, who had been in France for decades, agreed. You don't wanna be on the sidelines, so you come to the Gare du Nord, he said. Many migrants saw the station as a site of convergence and social potential. Lassana and his peers also said that it helped them to understand and to live in the real France, the one hidden by media representations and invisible from the sidelines of peripheral suburbs and immigrant dormitories. I'll now turn to talk about Lassana and his path. Lassana was 14 when he began to make plans to leave his home. The following year, unbeknownst to his family, he jumped onto a truck and went from village to village doing odd jobs until he made his way to Bamako, the Malian capital. His father sent his brother to get Lassana to return. Instead, Lassana refused, saved up more money and left for Cote d'Ivoire. This dramatic and secretive escape from the clutches of parental and elder sibling authority, as he tells the story, set the stage for his ensuing adventure across West Africa and eventually into France. The Bamanakan or Bambara proverb of the adventure is Tunga te dambe don, ngambe den numandon, which means exile knows no dignity but it knows a good child. Or in other words, as Lassana's friend Dembele put it, when you're on adventure, you're nobody. An almost identical proverb exists in Soninke, which we might translate as, our identity can be ignored in foreign lands, but not our courage. Migrants leave their home and go into a new world where the status they grew up with, 
means very little. What matters is their own hard work. That's what they see this. This is why they can take jobs that would otherwise be shameful. The proverb is a poetic concentration of the adventurer's liminal logic and of the notion that when they leave on adventure, they leave the constraints of village structures behind. But their activities at the Gaudinor suggest that they seek both dignity and respect, not only jobs and material resources through their time there. They hope to recover the masculine status and dignity denied by the police, their legal status, and their jobs. In this context, they suggest a new version of the proverb. Exile that lasts for decades may, may yet know dignity, if you have courage. Um, so I wanted to just give a brief sense of what the social scene is like in the Gal du Nord in the next excerpt. Um, so this is just a glimpse of the social scene and of um, a young uh, Malian Senegalese man named Amadou, who was the self-declared president of the Gare du Nord, but was also known as Sécurité sans salaire or security without salary. Um, by the time I met him, um, he was hoping to, you know, stop being part of illicit trading that he was a part of, and hopefully he thought meet a white woman at the Gare du Nord and um, sort of make a, get a resident permit and a French family. He had grown up in a village in the Kai region of Mali and was known as an excellent pickup artist, which his Soninke friends often joke, jokingly attributed to his ethnicity, which was Kasonke. Most of the time, Amadou was not hitting on women, but was interacting with his friends at the station, often in ways that displayed his own dominance. On three occasions, I saw him approach a group of people he knew and demand that they show him their Gare du Nord passport. He would mimic the police in stance, tone, and language, shaking his head and feigning anger when they took out their national passports. Each man in turn would try to satisfy his request with their Metro cards, their driver's licenses and other documents. But each time he would say, no, not that, the passport of the Gare du Nord, show me your papers, which was exactly what the police said. After a few rounds, someone who knew the game would eventually take out a pack of cigarettes and offer him one. Voila, he would say, that's it, that's the passport of the Gare du Nord. While the police ask these men to justify their presence by showing their state IDs or papers, Sécurité Sans Salaire instead asked his peers to justify their presence in this social setting by offering a symbol of sociability, a cigarette, which became the property of the group. These kinds of performances also earned him his nickname. Like the police, he attempted to control many of the social interactions that took place at the station, and unlike the paid security guard, he lacked a salary, but he had respect from his peers. Now return to the, the pathway of Lassana at the station. In 2009, just after he finally received a one-year resident permit, Lassana was sure of his future. This was when I met him. He described a pathway that would take him beyond France, to Northern Europe and imagined advancing in the construction industry, eventually becoming a worksite manager. By 2014, he could no longer envision that pathway and he complained more about splitting his head between France and Mali, using a frequent term I heard adventurers use to describe a general malaise and a lack of direction while in France. He was unable to get as good of a job as he had had before despite his tenure resident and work permit. He had not yet been able to break ground on his house that he hoped to build in Bamako. His family asked for more money each month, he said. Each year, the harvest seemed to be worse. He saw that migration routes were getting more dangerous and more people were dying before they made it to Europe. When his resident permit expired, would he be able to get a new one? When he went home for a visit, would he be able to return to France? He was not sure. Lassana, like many adventurers, began to question the whole undertaking. What was the purpose of adventure? 
How could migrants find a path out of struggle in a situation where even if they made it to France, they had to deal with being degraded by the police, their bosses, and the state immigration bureaucracy? They first had to find a way to step out from the sidelines. Entering the social world of the station was yet another departure on adventure, this time into what they saw as a true urban wilderness, away from the communities of their immigrant kin. Lassana hoped it would help him to become what he called a big somebody, that is to come of age and build wealth and prestige, gaining knowledge and world experience that he believed only travel to distant lands could offer. This is what the Gare du Nord method, what they were doing there, was building to, what it was ultimately for, not just to get by and find a job, but to help achieve the dignity of adulthood and prove their worth to themselves and to their brethren. As part of this quest, they sought relationships with French women and attempted to reposition their relationship to the French state and to their own kin. Ultimately, the adulthood that they achieved this way was precarious and required constant reachieving. This is my house, Lassana said one afternoon in the summer of 2014, unfolding a set of blueprints provided by a Senegalese architect that he had met at the Gare du Nord. One evening, I noticed that there was a silver piece of drain pipe sticking out of his bag. Each day from our work site, he said when I asked him about it, I take one piece like this home. It's for my house in Bamako. Eventually, it will create a high quality drainage system like the one you see on the building over there. He gestured across the street to a row of typical Parisian apartment buildings. Between the material he took back from his work site and the blueprints, his house in Bamako was becoming more concrete. Like all adventures, he had a plan. Like most of the house processes, it was a very long process. When I saw Lassana in the summer of 2015, he was fasting for the month of Ramadan for the first time since he had arrived in France. When I asked him what made him fast this year in particular, he said it was to satisfy his father's wishes. His father had always wanted him to fast, but he had never bothered him about it because Lassana still braided his hair, a sign that he was perhaps still an errant youth for whom observing Ramadan would have been an incongruous practice. Growing a beard and fasting would show that he was still on the socially sanctioned pathway, despite all of the detours and winding roads he had taken to achieve what moderate success he had found on his adventure. Like many underemployed adventurers at the Gau du Nord, he still lacked the funds to realize his house building dreams. And he finally settled for building his father a modern, as he called it, or that is a concrete house in their home village during a return visit in 2015. This was what his father had long wanted him to do, but he had resisted, fearful of getting stuck in the village or of deviating from the forward moving pathway he had in mind. In the summer of 2016, I met Lassana in the shiny new Starbucks cafe seating area in the front square of the Gare du Nord. It had replaced the bike racks where many of his peers used to hang out and have run-ins with the police. Lassana's situation in France was more or less the same. He was 35 and still had not found a long-term job. He had been getting by as a day laborer. In 2015, he traveled several hundred kilometers um, on a work team building a new high-speed train near Bordeaux. The project had ended, and from our phone discussions, it seemed he had only a few temporary short-term jobs that year. He and his friend Idris, a stylish dressed Malian with French papers, as Lassana put it, about the same age as Lassana, lamented the contemporary reality for Malians. Everyone is fed up, said Idris. Everyone wants to go back to Mali. They're fed up with France. Why don't they go back, I asked. Idris and Lassana looked at me incredulously. They can't, Idris said, even if they have papers now. They haven't done what they wanted to do. They, they haven't built a house in Bamako yet. And so they would have to deal with renting if they go back. Renting, he said, was a mark of shame. They would never be able to come back, he added, to complete their adventure unless they found a way to maintain their residency in France. To do that, they have to stay most of the year in France and try to find work so that when it's time to renew it, they are able to do so. We are not like our father's generation, are we? Lassana pointed out. We don't wanna just migrate, work as an unskilled laborer for 40 years, marry up to four women and go back and retire in the village. No, we have projects. <laughs> 
We want to build house, build something. As they distance themselves from their father's project, they also distinguish their tactics from more recent arrivals. As roots changed, so did the migrants. Idris and Lassana discussed the new generation of West Africans arriving in France with a mixture of awe and disapproval. They had endured such risk and hardship that they were broken. What they've seen, it changes them. And they're all about themselves. They forget about the villages, forget about sending money back. His words reminded me of what his father had said to me about Lassana when I had gone back to Yilakunda and his father complained about Lassana not sending enough money back. Lassana and Idris were aware of the strange disconnect between the representations of life abroad and the reality they faced every day, and also aware that the risk today's migrants faced surpassed anything they had confronted on their adventure. Based on my limited conversations with some of the men who had arrived recently, they also had much in common. They too were scared of getting stuck in France. They yearned for an elsewhere that would offer more opportunities for carrying out the hard work they demanded of themselves. Idleness was the enemy of adventure. If I could go home now, I would, Lassana said, but his trips home rarely lasted more than a few months each year. He was worried about losing his residency status in France or being out of the temporary labor market for too long. Migration regulations, for some, the impossibility of returning to France at all, keeps migrants from going back, even when they would like to. Returning meant potentially getting stuck again. They strove to prove their success and come of age, as their fathers and grandfathers also had but all the hurdles that they had confronted on these lengthy adventures had made their destination shift. The pathway they had envisioned of onward mobility abroad and prestige at home was crumbling before their eyes and they had to scramble to find a new pathway before it was too late. The places they came from, Mali, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, were shifting. New conflicts and ethnic divisions were arising that contrasted with the multilingual, multi-ethnic communities they had grown up with before leaving. And as they were trying to figure all of this out, their brothers and nephews were calling them, asking for help to cross the sea. I will end there for time's reasons. Thank you, Julie. Professor Kamroff, would you? I, thank you, am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Julie. Let me start off by just asking, um, a, a very obvious question, and you alluded to it already. In some ways, this is a long tradition. And what is wonderful about your story is that, as you say, this is not just a recent kind of neoliberal phenomenon that has emerged out of late 20th century conditions. So the whole structure of adventure and what it means obviously is durable. At another level, it's changing profoundly. But, and profoundly in a way that that, that suggests that it might not in fact continue. So what I wondered was on balance um, in that regard, how do you see it? Because in some ways, you, you, some of what you say now suggests that in fact, it's being on the road uh, that, that, that is what is at the core of this adventure. And the destination is infinitely postponed, even things like marriage and a home. But of course, the interesting thing is we're seeing postponements of things like marriage and homemaking in many parts of the world connected to increasingly difficult conditions of social reproduction. So how do you see this uh, in terms of your, your assessment of where it's going and whether it really is transforming in a way that has not is, is unprecedented? I think that was one of the main things I had to struggle with as I wrote the book, which was how to account for the fact that, um, yes, this was something that was very important to West Africans at the Gare du Nord, this idea of adventure. Um, and yet it was a structure that was not at all um, necessarily what their fathers and grandfathers even saw as adventure. Um, so it became a resource for them to understand the difficult experiences they had, I would say, more than it was some sort of social reproduction of an extremely, um, you know, a cultural tradition as if it's not really a enduring cultural structure as much as it became a resource. Um, and also a resource for me in the way that I, I saw them theorizing and analyzing migration themselves. Um, mm -hmm. 
and I and I think that it offered an important corrective to the way that we tend to see, or at least policy and um, including some literature tended to see migrants um, and migration. So um, I think I had to try to understand that. But as I came, you know, closer to you know, more recent years, and I kept going back and, and meeting with people again and again, I just noticed that um, there were moments where they said, this is it, this is the end, this is the end of adventure. Um, not everyone agreed with that, but there were certainly some people who realized that the conditions of social reproduction of this way of life, which is essentially migration for wage labor in order to then uh, support uh, places that have been so sort of marginalized by uh, sort of neoliberal policies, uh, agricultural policies, for example, that they can no longer reproduce themselves. So there's a sort of structural basis to the fact that these places can't reproduce themselves and that migration supports, um, but that it was no longer working, that the wage labor migration ad adventure was no longer uh, enough and that they needed to find other types of resources. Now, this doesn't mean that I think migration will end or that they think suddenly no one's, people are gonna stop migrating or anything like that. That seems to be totally against all empirical evidence, but rather that they had to diversify um, the kinds of approaches they took. And yes, this involved, you know, um, you know, a lot of uh, people saying, okay, I'm not gonna be a wage laborer anymore. I'm gonna go to China and try to start a business through goods I can get and purchase in China, which has been you know, the work of some great recent anthropologists. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think that, you know, there's just this system, this wage labor system that they're in, they recognize perhaps earlier than some people that the system is untenable in the long term. There's, there's a fascinating sense in your account um, of, of the, the, the the impetus to movement, the desire for the right to movement, and that to be human is to move. And that's more than simply coming from a marginal place where conditions of making a livelihood are, 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 are dire. So there's a kind of, and, and that's the optimistic side of your book. There's a sense here that there's a very human quest for adventure, for knowing, for travel. And, and, and as you say, it's necessarily a linear journey. There's a lot of zigzagging, it's back and forth. You move in West Africa before you can move to Europe. And, in Europe, you might not be on a linear track either. So there's that sense of this mobility and freedom that comes with this. On the other hand, these young people remain tethered in important ways to their kin in the village and maybe in the capital in Mali. And, and that the moral commitments that really weigh heavily on them um, and really are about uh, those to whom they have to prove at the end of the day their own moral achievements. So there's an interesting sense in which kinship, which they are escaping when they leave the village, is still not only a kind of moral uh, regulator of their lives, but also an anchor. So I wonder if you want to say something. Also, in that regard, there is another approach to the freedom of movement that you know, comes out of the European tradition. Like, for instance, Deleuze and Guattari talk about nomadism. And there's a kind of romance about nomadism in a lot of the writing in anthropology and beyond that you know, attracts to, attaches to this sort of phenomenon. You don't use that. And it seems to me there's something different in what you're saying about the freedom of movement, but maybe you want to say a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I, these were exactly the types of, of issues that I think um, structured my approach to, to um, understanding what was going on at the Galduno. Uh, and how in its all of its complexity, precisely because I couldn't quite get a sense of it through the logic of kind of the political economy of migration and the violence of borders literature, which was very helpful in understanding the structures that they were in, um, but tended to emphasize the suffering of migrants, which is very real. Uh, and, I, and I think that there is suffering here. But my interlocutors at the station, I mean, people like Lasna and his peers, they refused the kind of suffering subject. They did not, that did not resonate with them at all. And they proposed a very different kind of personhood. Um, and I thought that as an ethnographer, I had to, that was the most important thing I needed to take account of. And that did not, the, the, the literature on sort of the rhizomatic nomad, like that did not speak to 
the way that they managed to sort of maintain this rooting, what they saw as a kind of a rooting, despite all the critiques of this rootedness and the arboreal metaphors. Um, and yet also from that, um, sort of that rooting was what allowed them to grow into this adventure of mobility. And so it was that kind of idea of both rootedness and mobility that they had to mediate between. And they didn't see these as opposed as they so often were in the literature. Mm -hmm. And so I, one of the things I think we learn, or at least I learned from adventures at the Gare du Nord was sort of how to see a pathway, sort of a conceptual pathway uh, and some tools to reconceptualizing what we saw as an opposition between rootedness and mobility and actually to see how these things could coexist and sort of um, help to create certain kinds of persons who, who, who could um, sort of find mobility through um, their rootedness and what stopped them from being able to fully realize that um, combination of these two things was actually the structural factors, the immigrations placed on migration, the stuff that led them to not be able to move and return and go back as they wanted to. The, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you too was something you alluded to in your reading and the role of these, of, of this, these key characters, this clutch of young adventurers is really very powerful in the book, it seems to me because it sort of, it, it demonstrates the larger structural forces that you, you, you're talking about in your, in your analysis. But you mentioned that there was a way of, 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 there were obviously lots of differences and difficulties in accessing French society. But the idea of having relationships, romantic relationships with French women was very central. And at the same time, it was a kind of demonization of their own masculinity and sexuality from, from the point of view of many French observers. So what was interesting, it seemed to me, was that they sought out particularly women from the countryside rather than from the northern, more provincial places um, than they did from Paris itself. And it, was this, it, it, and it was women who themselves were also looking for adventure in a way. They were also looking to escape and to transcend. And these relationships come together in a really interesting way, even although, as you say, the trajectories imagined on each side were rather different. So I wondered if you wanted to say a little bit about that. And I was also thinking in terms of the wonderful picture you point of this kind of dangerous but interesting street masculinity of these young men who seem very suave and very stylish and so on. And I wondered if, do you, do you, do you watch the series Lupin? Have you watched the French series? Yeah. So, so Amadou Sai, you know, he's, he's got, Omar Sai, he's got this wonderful uh, uh, kind of critique of that form. Of, of, of masculinity as something which is, is um, very much more kind of a social bandit, but also a person who's highly desirable and very at home in French society. So they're kind of cultural commentaries, it seems to me, that speak on this, this question of, of the way in which the masculinity of these young men has been, in a sense, uh, uh, rendered dangerous. And I wondered if you want to talk to that, about that at all. Yeah, so this was one of the things that I really found um, at first very puzzling about what was going on at the station. And, um, you know, I, it was hard to account for in part because there were all of these ideas about street harassment in France um, and very sort of xenophobic and racist ideas about who was doing the street harassing uh, and about the Gare du Nord as being a center of quote unquote street harassment. Mm -hmm. I will say that the only person who really hit on me aggressively at the station, well, the only two people were both police officers, white police officers. Um, and so in my experience as a woman at the station, which certainly structured my research, um, that was sort of what I, that was my main experience of it. Um, so in addition to it, you know, obviously being a way to, you know, further demonize this purportedly dangerous, um, African male sexuality as it existed in French public space. I wanted to see how these men sort of dealt with that because they, they did say that that was why they were there when you asked them, even though they didn't spend a lot of time actually hitting on women. But I met a lot of couples who had met at the Gare du Nord and were long-term couples, often with children. 
And so I, I began to look at this and to understand, you know, how they did look for serious women, which they saw as more likely to be from the Northern sort of provinces that they thought would have more in common with them. And that, yeah, indeed, sort of we're also seeking um, different kinds of adventures. Mm-hmm. And, and so those women, um, you know, they didn't always agree on what they were seeking, but they were seeking different kinds of adventures. Mm-hmm. And what I ended up, you know, finding was just that the way that these men operated in this public space and ended up meeting women was actually based on a very astute observation and analysis on their part of the French gender system. Um, you know, they admitted that this wasn't the way that they would, you know, meet women, you know, in Bamako or certainly not in their home villages, um, but rather that this was how it was done in France. This, they knew that, you know, women were supposed to be open to the male gaze in France. And this is exactly what, you know, the French politicians said when they banned the, the wearing of the headscarf was that that's, that's part of psycho, you know, psychological development of women is to be sort of open to the male gaze for there to be this play in this mixed, you know, gender mixed environment as they saw it, very binary world. And, um, and that was, that was sort of, they, I think that they really saw that and realized that and said, yeah, so we're going to, we're going to, this is, this is this kind of gender system. And so that's how we're going to engage with people. And so they, you know, they never were aggressive, but they certainly were, you know, what they saw was playing by the rules that they astutely Mm -hmm. served. Uh, And of course they end up being demonized for it anyway, because, you know, the point is not that they're not playing by the rules. The point is that they're black. And in yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so sort of how they reacted and dealt with that and also ended up forming these long-term relationships um, yeah. fraught with a lot of different misunderstandings. Yeah. You want to take over? Thank you. Um, we can open it up to the audience's questions and comments now. You can use the hand raise feature that is part of this Zoom program. And um, perhaps as you're gathering your thoughts, um, I can ask a quick one. Um, Both you, Julie, and Professor Komarov have pointed to the adventure as a long tradition, which is um, perhaps in the midst of changing. Would that at all include um, women embarking on an adventure from uh, Mali and or um, because they themselves have the human need to travel and um, perhaps those the, the constraints have been loosened. But also as the migrants in France have difficulty in returning, as their post- postponement to return home um, is, is, is more at the fore, uh, do they um, facilitate the migration of women from their home villages, for example? Yes, um, absolutely. They, this is, a, I think, a major feature of what will happen as the adventure transforms and as migration restrictions change. And it's already happening, in fact, um, just as you say. Um, for many years now, um, marriage, my so-called marriage migration has been um, one of the few ways that um, people can migrate to France legally uh, or family reunification, as it's called as well. Um, It's one of the few ways to actually migrate um, and it doesn't quite as long as it does in the US, um, but that's how people come and and so they, um, you know, quite a lot of women have come that way and there are many, many, many Malian, Senegalese and Ivarian women. In the case of Malian women, they do often come, sorry about the background noise. Um, In the case of Malian women, they do often come as the wives um as a wife right so they don't come necessarily on their own whereas Ivorian women Senegalese women there are many many come on their own um and sort of follow a different rubric of of the adventure um and there's I think been some really important recent work sort of examining uh women uh, after women's migration to France um and in my work now I am looking at um uh, women's uh, Malian and Senegalese women's activism that results from migration. So women that either migrated as part of, you know, as part of coming to join their husbands or for or on their own, and then were deported and go back to Mali, um, and then end up sort of becoming uh, political activists when they didn't, when they all say they didn't really have 
um, much of an interest in politics prior to migration. So the way that these migrant journeys end up transforming kinship and social relations, as well as kind of creating a new kind of political consciousness. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts or questions, Professor Komarov? Or... I'm sorry, your... Um... Am I unmute? Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, I want to come back to Omar Sy. Um, what, what strikes me as interesting in a lot of popular culture out of France right now is the role of African artists um, uh, and, and, and performers um, and writers in actually casting light on this principle that you're, you're, you're discussing and seeing the signs in interesting ways. I mean, even call my agent, for instance. I mean, there was a very interesting way in which uh, the racialization of prejudice was turned inside out. And many of the most knowing characters who really understood the French gender system and everything else were in fact migrants from Africa. So that struck me as an interesting phenomenon. I, there's a dialectic going on here, which, is, which also means that there are elements of French society responding and engaging and understanding what's going on in this process. Yes, I think absolutely. And I think that it often are, it's often um, people who are both outsiders in a particular kind of outsider who's marginalized, who, you know, is able to be such an astute observer and also to make visible um, things that were uh, previously invisible. And I think that this is true both for migrants in everyday life, just as it is true in scholarship. Um, you know, people like um, the French, Senegalese scholar Mam Fatou Nyang or Maboula Sumaoro, who are both um, you know, working on questions of race in France and have done so sort of through a dialogue with what's going on in the US. Um, and I think um, you know, it's through their work as well as through the way that you know, I do think migrants have this ability to, in many ways, um, you know, shed light on things that we did not see previously, um, simply because um, we were sort of looking at the discourse um, of power. And I, for me, what is powerful about anthropology is not just to deconstruct um, discourses of power, but also to displace our common sense understanding of the world um, through the ethnography that we do, through the people and their analyses and theorizations of the world, and to displace those, those common sense um, those common sense ways of seeing the world. And I think for me, that was what ended up being the most powerful thing I could do. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Martha Lagas. I'm sure I pronounced it incorrectly. Hi, um, I've read your book and it's, it's wonderfully written and uh, I love it so much. And I was following, on, following along a little bit with some of the passages that you were reading. Um, and one thing that was very striking in the book was the history of the station that you described um, and how that is changing. Um, and I'm curious if you could say a little more about how the design of the station um, now or perhaps going forward uh, facilitates interactions or, um, or uh, poses a barrier. Um, in sort of in the guise of, you know, stations becoming more open and more modern and so on. I, I'd love to hear more. Thank you so much for, for reading it and also for your question. I really appreciate it. Um, yes, so the, the station was totally redesigned not that long before I started my fieldwork. And um, I found that it was, um, you know, very difficult to navigate for me um, because it was sort of redesigned to have this huge central hall with lots of overlapping stairways and um, escalators and you could easily end up on sort of the wrong level and then not be able to get where you were going. Um, so it was very confusing to me. Um, and I found that, for example, you know, a lot of the um, West Africans who ended up there sort of used that to their advantage because they knew it extremely well. And they were able to master a space that was actually very, very difficult to master. I still would get lost in the station after years of doing research there. Um, 
And as you say, you know, the station was designed, was redesigned to be more open from the 19th century design. Um, but, you know, in the end, it, you know, creates, a, you know, it just created a lot. There was, when it was like more open and transparent and democratic, as the architects put it, it ended up also being much more highly surveilled uh, and policed. And that that was sort of part of this redesign. And I think initially when I thought about this, I sort of stopped there. And what I really was fascinated by was actually, no, it doesn't, the story doesn't end with this paradoxical effect of the built environment because it's what people did with it um, that mattered. And so it was the way that people used this redesign to um, sort of practice certain kinds of vigilance um, in the station to watch out for each other, for example. Um, the way that they, um, you know, had to uh, figure out new all to know and figure out exactly where the exits were, exactly where the police could kind of hide, so that if they were undocumented, they wouldn't be stopped by the police on a random uh, identity check. Um, and so, you know, it, it sort of became part of their social practices. This redesigned space, um, and I don't know. Um, can I show a slide? Am I allowed to do that? Yes, you are. Um, so I'll just quickly um, show you this slide because, um, so this this was the station when I was doing research 10 years ago. Um, and, um, sorry. and this is the station in the, in the 19th century when it was built. And then this is the redesigned hub that I was just talking about. Um, but there's this sort of new project that's actually now been re very recently scrapped, I think just in the last couple of weeks, um, they're gonna redo this project, but not for the reasons that I would have redone it for other reasons, like related to money. Um, so this was the architect's idea of the redesigned Gal du Nord. So these are images from the architectural firm that's redesigning the Gal du Nord. Um, so apparently according to those architects, you know, um, I guess every all the users of the future will be, you know, well-heeled white Parisians who use the station. Um, and while this design will not go through, certainly some other version of this redesign will go through. And the idea is to make the station a sort of place of leisure and productivity. There's a jogging track, there's a we work and sort of more consumption um, with some higher end stores um, in, inside parts of the station. Um, but I think that if my ethnography shows anything, it's that whatever sort of space will end up occurring here, of course that will in part structure what people end up doing in there. But um, these um, uh, you know, adventurers are going to use the space and figure out new and unexpected ways that we can't predict um, based on whatever redesign ends up happening. And I think that that in the end is what uh, we can we can examine and we can learn from is how they'll end up reusing the space as opposed to how the space determines their social lives. Thank you. Um, is I, the, may I ask a question? It just follows on. Is that what you mean when you say that they hack infrastructure? Uh, well, that's, I guess that's part of it, but, you know, specifically when I talk about the hacking of infrastructure, you know, they're also, they're noticing specific gaps in the infrastructure and they're trying to yeah. re-channel um, that gaps to, to help those gaps to help them. So, yeah, I think part yeah. of it is like the spatial mastery part, um, yeah. you know, um, trying to, you know, kind of transform how these channels are supposed to work or how movement through the station is supposed to work. Um, as a channel, they're sort of rechanneling that a bit in, in the hopes of using the station to build their social networks, basically. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful icon of the French public, you know, the idea of the public with all its contradictions, its transparency and its exclusions and its surveillance and, and, and all of this. You know, it's really fascinating from that point of view. Thank you. Um, I have just one more quick question, if you don't mind. Um, as um, West African migrants meet up with migrants from other parts of the world, how do their own narratives become changed or disruptive and vice versa? How are other communities' migration narratives affected in, in your experience? Oh, that's such a great question, Krishna. And I wish that I had a good answer to it. Um, 
you know, I think that, um, I mean, a lot of their purpose is meeting other kinds of migrants. And I think, um, you know, so while their West African community is absolutely multinational and multilinguistic, uh, yeah. you know, there are other, lots of other communities at the Gau du Nord. And it really depended on the different communities. Some of the communities um, they saw as actually sort of reinforcing a kind of ethno-nationalism. So they saw, for example, the Congolese community, um, mostly from the um, DRC, as reinforcing um, a kind of ethno-nationalism by sticking to each other and not branching out in the way that they were, um, which I'm not saying that that's actually true, but that's sort of how they saw it. So they used that community that they didn't really learn from them as much as they use them as a kind of foil to define them, to redefine themselves. Um, but, you know, I see, um, I think that they, they see the possibility of new opportunities with all of these social interactions. And so I, I think that it's hard to say, I don't think it's based on like, they learn this from this community or they learn this from this community, but it's more about, you know, how these social interactions come together, for example, at this, um, you know, Chinese owned cafe that they ended up frequenting by the time I had left, they had stopped frequenting all the French owned cafes because of all the racism they experienced going to those cafes. Um, and instead found, you can see that quite a lot of West Africans found a home in this cafe that was run by a Chinese man and his family. Um, and they all, they all knew each other by name, you know, they, and they became quite close. And so I think, you know, I think this question remains to be answered. And I think it's a wonderful one to ask um, of future research. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we might um, begin concluding. Um, Professor Komarov, do you have any last remarks before we do so? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that this is an, an extraordinary uh, um, analysis because precisely the way in which you balance the, the realities of the situation and, and the, this paradox of these, these, these adventurers who managed to take hold of a central institution with boldness they're not going to remain marginal. And, 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 and they, the, the amount of knowledge and understanding, and as you say, you know, not only the street level, but the theoretical understanding of how the society works is extraordinary. And yet there's the poignance of what you say, that they remain in many ways locked out of decent work, reliable work, that, that life is precarious. And in some ways they remain a kind of reserve, you know, force of labor. And that also is very... You know, it's 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 consonant with our times where we both demonize and we know this in this country, we demonize and criminalize immigrants, particularly immigrants of color. And yet we rely on them, you know, in, in, in all kinds of ways for perpetuating what many of us call, you know, racial capitalism, right? There's an extraordinary richness to the story. And I'm just delighted that you're now picking up also the other end of this and looking at the very real politics of the way in which migrants all over the world are beginning to connect over this question of not only their rights to, to circulate, but the fact that they, they are in fact a global circulating underclass. And we still need them for our social reproduction in societies in the North, at times we criminalize and demonize. So there's something, I mean, I think you capture something very central about the world system here, but you do it with a way that is, is not only uh, 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 critically humane, but also, as you say, adds the anthropological insight and the human, you know, the, the voices of people who are living this and thinking. So it's a very, it's a wonderful project. Thank you so much, Jean. And um, I, I, you know, I feel like I've begun to touch on some of the threads you mentioned, and I'm sort of picking up on them right now. And something I'm working on about that I'm calling wealth in migrants, which is about how migrants provide different kinds of value to people, including the people who demonize them. They're enormous political currency in Europe, for example. Exactly. Um, and they absolutely need migrants, not just for social reproduction of labor and in labor, which they do, but also for um, their political goals. Um, without migrants, most of the right, I mean, all of the right wing, sort of um, the new right wing in Europe, um, it, you know, would not be, would not have been elected. So um, I think that you can see how they, they have different kinds of currency for different, mm -hmm. for different people. And then they have to try to, you know, articulate their own sense um, as well of value. So yes, thank you for pushing me to look at those things. Well, 
Well, Julie, thank you so much for a very important and fascinating work. And thank you both um, for this fantastic conversation. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you so much, Krishan. Thank you to the Hutchins Center.